Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast, inside the business, buzz, and brilliance of Black entrepreneurs. Here is your host, Dr. Francis Richards. What happens in Vegas goes all over the world on Black Entrepreneur Experience, episode number 434. Thank you for joining us as we elevate the Black Entrepreneur Experience by interviewing CEOs, thought leaders, innovative thinkers, and Black entrepreneurs across the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Francis Richards. Today's guest is a Dominican-American author, poet, and spoken word artist, is dedicated to supporting young people as executive director of Multicultural Classroom. Welcome, Roberto Germain. Hey, thank you, Dr. Richards. What a pleasure to be here. I've been following your podcast recently, following some of the content you create in general, and I am enthused by the way that you support the Black community, by the way that you support business owners, and I'm grateful to be here with you. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it, and it is my honor and pleasure to have you at the mic. I've given our audience such a brief bio. Why don't you fill in the gaps and share with our audience what you want them to know about you and your business? Yes, absolutely. So I grew up in Lawrence, Massachusetts. That's really where I learned how to navigate not just the world, but also the streets. Uh, Lawrence is a tough place, but thankfully it made me the person that I am. It helped me to just build character and through the situations that I went through, it inspired my writing and my business ultimately, because unfortunately I come from a poor school system. And I also worked in that system as a teacher, as an administrator, uh, principal. I have firsthand insight in terms of how education can impact students positively and negatively. And so I wanted to take my experiences and really pour into my writing, but I also wanted to create something business-wise in which I wasn't just talking about issues, but I was offering solutions. I was leaning into them. I am being the change that I want to see. And so my business, Multicultural Classroom, my wife and I engage in this business together in which we support school leaders, teachers, and other organizations in addressing anti-bias, anti-racist work and really being champions for that. Why? Because we want to see people on equal playing ground and we want to see voices and stories amplified, particularly the ones that have been historically suppressed. Roberto, you said something really profound in your intro. You talked about anti-bias racism. And it's it appears we're in a culture that that is not what they want to hear. How are you working around that or navigating through it? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes the resistance is so strong that I just want to let go. And I just want to do something else. But ultimately, when I'm thinking about the needs in our community, and I'm thinking about my children, and I'm thinking about the people around me, and I'm thinking about all the young people that I've worked with throughout the years, and how I've been able to impact them. And not to say that every young person that I've worked with has had a great experience with me, but by and large, I, I would say that many of them have benefited just from my presence. But then it's not just my presence, it's my investment in them. It's, it's the love that I pour into them and the teachers that, that I was leading poured into them, right? Because we, we do this in solidarity. And so when I think about that, it keeps me going. How are we able to navigate this? Well boldly. We move in a bold and courageous manner. We are not afraid to say what's on our minds. We are not afraid to lean into truth telling. In fact, that's one of our strategies. It's, it's teaching people truth telling strategies. We're offering counter narratives. You're not going to erase our history because we're not going to allow for that. You can only erase our history if we allow you to do that. We're creating our own stories, we're sharing them, we're publishing them, we're not waiting for anybody to validate our work. That's why I published my book, Blue Wing Tears, because I had 20 years of experiences that cover a range of, of themes and topics, but some of it is related directly to justice, to identity, to culture, to the things that we experience in black and brown communities, knowing that 
my stories would resonate with others, but that also there's a public that doesn't come from what I come from, that has not walked in my shoes, that needs to read my words, that needs to at least try to understand my experience. I need to bring them to the table in some way, shape, or form, and we need to be in proximity. And words and, and, and poetry has a way to open people up. And so it allows for me to foster some conversations, right? In, in which we can lean into certain curiosities and dismantle certain myths. And for those that are not trying to hear it, well, I can't change everybody, but I can attempt to engage people in the conversation. And I have a responsibility to tell the truth even when it makes other people uncomfortable. So my strategy is to move in a bold and courageous manner and let the spirit guide me in doing so and to create quality content that's going to impact people in a positive way. Who is your ideal client? My ideal client is, well, we largely work with schools, K through 12, some on the university level, but largely our clients are folks in the K through 12 space, in the educator space, teachers, instructional leaders. And our aim is to help them expand their toolbox. Many folks have resources, but there are also, we have found in our work that there are people that have a willingness, they have a desire, they have the curiosity, they're interested in having courageous conversations, if you will, but they don't necessarily know how to go about it. They don't have the resources that feel practical to them. So sometimes they come across things that are on a high level theoretically, but they don't know how to make it practical. So that's what we do. We create resources that make things practical for educators that come Monday morning at eight o'clock they're ready to implement those resources. For our audience that's listening, what do you call a courageous conversation? What is Ooh, a yes, topic? Yes, yes and, and that's that's not a, a term that I've coined, but many people are familiar with Linton's work of courageous conversation, the Pacific group, Glenn Singleton. And so courageous conversations are the conversations that people consider taboo or conversations that make people uncomfortable or conversations centered around race, racism, talking about systems, identifying them and talking about dismantling those systems that are inequitable, right? There's another term that some people don't like, equity, equality, right? There's a lot, there's a lot of terms out there that make people uncomfortable. Even the name of my business, multicultural classroom. That's the term that makes some folks here where I am in Florida, uncomfortable, but not just Florida, in many other spaces, we're experiencing some of the same things because racism is going to manifest itself, whether you're in a red state or a blue state, right? We all experience it and we experience it in different ways, but it's present. We know it, even if folks don't want to acknowledge it, it's easy for us to identify what's happening. It's it's easy to identify who has access and and who, who doesn't, right? Even if we think about the case right now with the Supreme Court and the venture capitalist group, right? Black women who want to fund black businesses, want to support black women. The fact that there, at least right now, it's been halted. We'll see what ultimately happens. But wow, like how many things have to happen for folks to realize that we have a major problem in this country. And we're just talking about coming to the table and being at equal footing, right? We're talking about that, like equal opportunities, like leveling the playing field. Well, my work's never gonna stop because they continue to inspire us to speak out against these injustices. That's a courageous conversation right there. Why is this happening? to this particular group, black owned business, black women who want to fund other black women. Why are they being stopped from doing so? I think that's a good question to ask. Why isn't this happening with other groups? 
And it's interesting that you would bring that up about the fearless funds, because I was actually thinking, I don't know if I was thinking or dreaming about them. And it was, and I'm, it's preposterous that they can use a law that was put in place to talk about race. When the law was put in place, Black people were not considered even people. Mm. So how can you apply a law to me when you were not speaking to me? Come on. I'm just like, for this to get to that point, and white people fund white people all day. And all day, every day, all day, forever. every day. And how, but what we know, what we know for a fact is every rule and law that was put on the books, they already have a system in place to dismantle that law. So if right. you look at history, when it would be a myth that even when you look at the welfare system, they claim that more African-Americans have benefited from welfare, which is not true. Mm. When you think about affirmative action or when you think about other laws that they put in place, for example. Well, the affirmative actions are a really good one, right? Because Okay, you want to get rid of affirmative action? Cool, but let's do it across the board. All right, no more legacy admissions, right? That's just one example. Like, you can't say like, oh, well, affirmative action only benefits Black folks. But then legacy admissions has been a practice in this country forever. Like, we have to look at things holistically. Yes, yes. And let's step back. When you were talking about naming your business, Multicultural Classroom. When you think about naming your business 2023 and beyond, would you still have named your business Multicultural Classroom? Well, that's a great question. That's a great question. I probably would need a little more time to ponder that, to be honest with you. But it could be easy for me in the moment to say that I wouldn't. It also could be easy for me to say in the moment that I would because I'm in an interview and maybe I want to come off a certain way, right? Like, I'm just saying like the natural human tendency. I'm not sure because the way things have developed in my life, these are things that I couldn't have predicted. I didn't know I was I would be here. I was a principal and before that, I was an English teacher and a basketball coach. I thought I would coach basketball forever. I love basketball. But I also didn't realize that God had bigger plans for me than to coach basketball. And that's no shade on anybody that coaches ball. I'm just saying, like, in, for my life, there was a different tra trajectory. And it was to continue to ascend as a school leader. And as I did that, then I thought I would be a principal forever. And then life happens and, and things change. And then we moved from Massachusetts to Texas. And after seven years in Texas, went from Texas to Florida. I didn't know things were going to be this hostile as it relates to the nature of the work that I do. And then not just in Florida. I was in Texas for seven years. It was they compete for like who's crazier <laughs> and who's who's most hostile as it relates to the nature of, of this type of work, of anti-racist work. I don't know. Perhaps in, in my logic, if I could anticipate those type of barriers, maybe I wouldn't have, but I'm still comfortable and at peace with the name of our business. And I think about my ancestors, right? I think about the people that laid down the foundation and paved the road for me to be where I am right now, to be doing this work. Even in my, in my book, Blue and Tears, I have a poem dedicated to MLK Jr. because his words and his work really impacted me, inspired me. In such moments, I, I start thinking, I'm like, man, a lot of people went through it so that I could stand on their shoulders and do this work in a bold and courageous manner. Does that mean I can't change my business name? I could change my business name. We're still going to be doing the work. As of right now, it's multicultural classroom, but 
Dr. Richards, it, at some point, maybe we start a separate business so that we could continue to slide in certain spaces and do what we got to do to advance the cause. I don't know, but I think this is probably part of strategy sessions for the future in which we talk about how we continue to move forward. What is your zone of genius? My zone of genius? I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. <laughs> Another way to frame it is what is your superpower? I guess my superpower is I'm an active listener. The Lord puts people in my path, oftentimes random people. I'm in the streets and I just happen to encounter somebody and they'll just tell me their stories. And I think in our society, many of us are accustomed to the hustle and bustle. And so we're always in a rush. And as a result, we don't have time to listen to other people, to connect with them, to engage with them. And I think I have that superpower that I'm an active listener and I'm a connector. I like connecting with different people. I like connecting with different communities. Completely okay stepping stepping outside of my comfort zone. I'm okay with dwelling in different spaces. I'm okay with taking on new challenges. But active listening to me is an important skill. And I try to exercise that as much as possible. And I hope in doing so, that people feel affirmed. Talk about your book, Blue in Tears. Yes, yes, for and sure. That, and that title. Yes, Blue in Tears, a collection of poems. This book is a passion project that I had on my heart and mind for 20 years. When I was at, in undergrad at Merrimack College in North Andover, Massachusetts, I was just looking at all of my writing and considering how active I was in the scene in terms of performance poetry and the different audiences I was engaging with. I was already touring schools by sophomore year, sophomore, junior year of college. And so I was just noticing how audience was engaging with my content and looking at how much writing I had and thinking to myself, I have something here. I think I have a book on my hands. And I, I was trying to get it published then, but I didn't know how to go about it. And I did not have the resources. I didn't have people guiding me. I just had a whole lot of notebooks and folders with all my writing and journals, but I did not know how to take those next steps. I was trying to figure it out. And I go to printing companies, I get the numbers and I'm like, wow, that's expensive. I'm a college student. <laughs> How am I gonna afford to do that? got put on the back burner. Then I get into my career. And as I was ascending in my career, it was like too busy putting down fires as, as an administrator. And so the writing continued to get placed on the back burner. When I moved from Texas to Florida, I said, now that I'm not leading schools full time, it's now or never. I have to do this thing now. It's so heavy on my heart. Blueing Tears is really chronicling my experiences for the past 20 years, talking about themes of justice and identity, both cultural and language, talking about relationships, relationships with family members, my aunt, my father, relationships with young ladies. And, and I mention that because I think it's important for young people to hear like you, there's a positive way that we could talk about relationships. I hear a lot of content that comes out and I hear a lot of the music that's coming out and I don't like the way that our young people are being represented. I definitely don't like the way that they're talking about women or young women. And I have two daughters. I have, I have three young kids, two girls and a boy. And so for me, it's important to model the example for our young people. So I talk about relationships in a real and intimate way without disrespecting anybody. And so I try to do that with this book. And I also talk about grief. I lost my father last year. And so there's a lot of things that surface for me and I wanted to capture that and be vulnerable with, with my audience. And writing also is a form of healing for me. And so I address some of that grief through my writing. So Blueing Tears is a labor of love that chronicles my past 20 years that I just wanted to share with the people. 
Thank you for that and our sincere sympathy for your loss. So grieving but grateful. Grieving but grateful. Yes, yes. Give us a poem from the book. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, which one? So many to choose from. <laughs> I'll give you a haiku. I wrote this poem, Truly, Truly, and it's it's one of the early ones in the book. And it's a haiku, three-line poem, but I use the title as an entry into the poem. Truly, truly, I say to you, our faith has to be bigger than our trust in others. They will disappoint. Short and simple to the point. And, and with this piece, I wanted to think about and talk about expectations. And sometimes we place expectations on people and that, that may be an unfair thing to do. They might not even know that we place those expectations upon them. Even if they do, perhaps it's not fair that we have, but also wanted to convey the message in there that it, it's important for us not to just trust in people because ultimately they'll disappoint us. We have to place our trust in something bigger than people. And for me, it's you know placing my trust in God placing my trust in the Lord, being grounded in my faith in that sense. And then I'll share with you this one other piece. Shoes, they stay on the shelf a long time, far longer than the others. Black on black, smooth leather, crispy, clean, thick soles. The others are supposedly a better fit, even if they're a size too small or too big, undervalued, underutilized, despite their all-purpose capabilities. Perfect candidates to win the race, sprint or marathon, dependable, trustworthy, judged by their color, perceived to cause discomfort. Purchasers don't understand their worth, not seen as mainstream, viewed as a disruptor. No opportunity to run the race, no exposure to the world. Like knotted laces, all tied up. Thank, you, thank, thank you, you for that. I hear the passion and the emotion behind your poetry. So thank you so much for that. I want you to have a monologue. And I want you, Roberto, to name this person living or not. Mm. They've inspired you so much. What are you saying to this person and why? Well, my father, Cecilio Herman, thank you. Thank you for not being like your father. You had a choice and you chose to parent your children. You chose to make many sacrifices, including leaving Dominican Republic and coming to the United States leaving behind your language, culture, customs, and completely adapting to this interesting land so that my siblings and I can have better opportunities. And I can't thank you enough for that. I can't thank you enough for that because the United States is a lot of things, but it's undeniable that there are many opportunities here for people to advance and that by the grace of God, I've been able to, not just for myself, but to also support many people in advancing. And so that is part of your legacy. And thank you for, for grounding me in my faith. Thank you for pushing me for the discipline that you instilled in me. Thank you for loving me. I love you. Speaking of legacy, Roberto, when it's all said and done, how do you want to be remembered? When it's all said and done, I want to be remembered as someone who strived to walk in righteousness, someone who worked actively to love his neighbors, and a person that just gave it all, gave it all in pursuit of making any space in which I existed a, a better place leaving behind a positive impact and having touched many lives that strive to do the same. 
There are so many brands and businesses that are dominating. Talk about a brand or a business that's dominating that you admire and why. Yeah, great questions. I've been been particularly interested in what Brother KB, Kevin Burgess, is doing with His Glory Alone, HGA. And in regards to the content they're creating musically under HGA, His Glory Alone, the content they're creating with the podcast, the Southside Rabbi podcast with KB and Amin, the merch line in partnership with Native Supply, and recently... KB also published his book, Dangerous Jesus. I respect the moves that Brother KB, Kevin Burgess, and his team, his glory alone, are making. I love the fact that he's presented numerous brothers in the community with opportunities to be part of his movement, be part of his brand, to bring their talents as creatives, to the table, whether in music production or video production or creative designs as it relates to the merch line, I applaud them and I'm observing and supporting them. I'm learning from them and I anticipate that we'll collaborate also. You talked about your book, Blue and Tears. How can they purchase that book? Yeah, definitely. So Blueing Tears is available across all the different book platforms, including Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, all the different book platforms. It's distributed through Ingram Spark. You could also purchase it directly on my website, multiculturalclassroom.com. Definitely purchase through our website. I mean, you can purchase anywhere, but if you purchase through our website, you could also become a subscriber, keep up with the content that we produce, receive the, the newsletter, receive the podcast, and just stay in the loop as to what we are doing in the K-12 through space and beyond. So again, Blue Ink Tears, a collection of poems available on Amazon and your different book platforms, along with our website, multiculturalclassroom.com. Advice you wish you had followed? Well, this is not necessarily advice I wish I had followed, but it's advice I wish someone had given me at a young age, like 18 or 22. Invest. <laughs> invest early. Invest in the S&P 500. And develop that discipline of investing. And I, I have now, but, you know, compound interest starting at 18 or 22 is, is different than when you start figuring things out, you know, late 20s, early 30s. Absolutely. What problem exists in the world today that you would like to solve? I'd love to solve the problem of division amongst people groups. You know, it's a lot of what I do, a lot of what I talk about. And there's, there's so much division. And I want to see people united across their differences, across racial, ethnic, language differences. I want to see a balance of power. I want to see folks have equal opportunities and access. But I definitely want to see us do a better job in terms of communicating with one another, and really working towards loving one another and to use the notion that Brian Stevenson drives home in Just Mercy, I want to see people be in proximity to one another. What's next? What's on the horizon for multicultural classroom? Yes, great question. So we're always working on stuff and we have a few books in the works. So what's next? Well, we have a picture book that we're working on. We have a, another book that we're writing that is targeting uh, Christian educators in particular and really challenging them to consider how their faith should be calling them into action as it relates to justice. 
So this is tied to a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, including race. How is your faith driving you to address some of these issues? How are you leaning into it, this voice in yourself, so on and so forth? So that's another book that is immediately on the horizon. And additionally, we're looking to continue to grow as it relates to bringing people onto our team who perhaps they don't necessarily have all that they need to start their own business, but they would benefit from being under our wing for a period of time until they're ready to launch. We're not trying to hold people hostage. We want to see people grow and do their own thing because we're not viewing that others as in competition with us. We're in partnership to get this thing done. Our hope is to be able to share our experiences, guide others, support others, help build them up, present them with some opportunities to build their resume, but also to increase their revenue and then to challenge and encourage them to launch if that's what, what they really want to do. Speaking of the publishing world, what is some advice you would give someone that is interested in writing a book? Wonderful, wonderful. I would say do your research. Follow your heart. If it's really in you to write a book, then do it. Do not be discouraged because there's going to be plenty of things along the way that can discourage you. But you need to have thick skin to work through that. Consider the different avenues that you can explore. A lot of people get hung up on, well, if I don't go with a publisher or if, if I don't go with a big name publisher, then it's not worth doing. Scrap that. We've done both. And so we could talk about the pros and cons of both approach. But I'm also big on ownership. I'm really big on you owning the rights to your content. And if you're able to go that route, I definitely encourage folks to self-publish. It is a lot of work, I'm not going to lie. But at least for me, if you have that type of mentality, it's worth it. Now, if you don't want to take that route, then fine. There's a lot of publishers, big and small, probably going to want to find a literary agent and work in partnership with that literary agent to identify the right publishing house and then go from there and be open to feedback, be prepared to go through many revisions, set some realistic timelines for making it happen, and then just commit yourself. Commit yourself to seeing it through. And along the way, bring people into your journey. Start, build your audience. Don't, don't wait for the book to be published. Build your audience as you're going through each step in the process. And that's a great suggestion. That's a great gem. Dr. Rich, there's so many resources out there that can support folks in going through the process, whether you're self-publishing or whether you're going with a publishing house. There are many great resources. One book that was very helpful to me, it's a book called Self-Publishing by Chandler Bolt. And he lays it out step by step what sh you should be doing. And again, that's just one resource. Is that there are many other resources? And his his program, uh, his brand is called Self Publishing School. So I also would navigate the website, take the good, lead the bad. But I found that there were many resources that were that helpful to me in the process. So hey, if you've never done it before, do not be discouraged. Everything is a learning opportunity if you allow yourself to go through it. If you are open to learning, which also includes failure, right? And that's that could be a hang up for people. Oh, because I, you know, I don't want to fail. How's it going to look? No, 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 no. Sometimes we have to fall flat in our face so we could get up and then we could come out with our chest puffed up because we went through it. Those are valuable experiences. Tell us your why. Why do you do what you do? I do what I do because I feel called to do so. I feel like God has given me certain gifts and I have the responsibility to share those gifts with the world. And one of my gifts is that I'm not afraid to speak up. 
another one of my gifts is that I'm I'm passionate when I speak. And so that resonates with, with some audiences. And then I'm a person that aims to be a servant leader. And I do see it as a gift to be able to serve others. Like I'm blessed when I do that and other people are blessed. But then when I see the ripple effect of, hey, you know, it might inspire people around me to move in that same manner and, and to serve others. And I'm like, wow, yes, yes, this is what we want. This is what we want to see. We, we want to see people not just invested in themselves. We want to see them loving and serving others, loving their neighbors, extending a hand, helping other people to progress. I shine, you shine. That should be the mindset. How can we all win together? Roberto, if you conducted this interview, what is the one question you would have asked yourself? I want you to ask the question and answer it. That's a good one, Dr. Richards. Oh, you're throwing me some, some tough questions today. I guess I would ask myself, what do young people really need to hear today and why? And the response to that is, our young people need to hear that they are beautifully and wonderfully made and that there's purpose in each and every one of their lives. They need to explore that purpose and make sure it's, it's coming from the, the right place, right? Make sure that the motives of the heart are pure. And sometimes in order to, to understand that, we need to tune out all the noise, all the distractions, all the content that's coming our way that serves as deceptive tools to lead us off course. We've come to the part of our interview. It's called Rapid Round of Fun. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I'd like you to give me very quick answers. If there's something you desire not to answer, feel free to say pass. Are you ready for the rapid round Let's of fun? Go. Let's go, Dr. Richards. <laughs> what is your favorite comfort food? Ice cream. What food you eat every week, no matter what? Eggs. Your ideal car? One that's reliable and doesn't cost me a lot of money and repairs. The last movie you saw? I don't really remember what the last movie was that I saw, but Probably the one with Jamie Foxx. Uh, don't they clone Tyrone, I think it's called. You relax doing what? Playing pickleball. Your favorite singer or rapper? I say right now, favorite singer is a group called Cairo Worship. They sing in Spanish. Favorite rapper right now, I'd say KB, Brother Kevin Burgess, HGA. Your favorite dance song? I don't know. I'm old school, so something from the 90s. I don't know. Maybe a kid and play song. Workout or hit the couch? Workout. Roberto Germain, thank you so much for joining us on Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast. Before we let you go, share with our audience the best way for them to connect with you and to do business with you and feel free to leave all your social media handles. Yes, yes. Hey, my people, thank you for tuning in. Dr. Richards has been wonderful with all these amazing questions. If you want to continue to learn more about me, Roberto Germán, and my business, Multicultural Classroom, check us out at multiculturalclassroom.com. Also, across all social media platforms, at Multicultural Classroom. That's Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all that jazz. And you can also find us on LinkedIn, Multicultural Classroom, and me individually, Roberto Germán. It's been a pleasure. God bless you. Walk in peace, power, and purpose. 
That's a wrap. Thank you for listening and subscribing to Black Entrepreneur Experience. We would love for you to leave a review and rating on iTunes and share with your friends. For show notes and more episodes, go to www.beepodcast.com. Join us next Wednesday. And remember, green is the new black. So keep your bank accounts and your business in the black.